This is the third time we do this in public, and the overall objective is unchanged, is to provide an input, a fact-based input, into this all-important debate on energy and energy policy. What we do, as you know, is we make a point forecast, no excuses, so no scenarios, uh, no big assumptions outside of it. And then we use it to look at uh, what we call the fault lines in the system. What could go wrong? Where are there long-term trends on a collision course? Where are there clear decision points where today's decision will alter the future? Well, the big trends are unchanged. And in one word, it is that the world needs more energy. We have uh, energy demand growth roughly unchanged. So between 2010 and 2030, the increase in energy consumption will be about 40 percent. And that, of course, has lots of people worried. You know, where does it come from? Where exactly does it go through? There are some very powerful forces which will help the world to continue to match these targets, to continue to produce the energy it needs for economic growth. Uh, and they are economic mechanisms. The first one is the tremendous increase in energy efficiency which we see emerging over time. It gets better and better. More and more GDP can be produced with, relatively speaking, less and less energy inputs. And that, of course, is a result of the competitive pressure of energy being expensive. And the second one is on the supply side, is this never-ending story uh, of finding new technologies and new supplies, which make accessible new resources which were not accessible before. And we have splendid examples seen over the last few years, first with the shale gas revolution, uh, mostly in the US, and now with the revolution in shale oil. The application of these very technologies which had been developed to produce shale gas to the case of oil. And in this year's uh, energy outlook, we'll take a closer look at this segment uh, of the market at tight oil and shale gas and how that will develop to the horizon of 2030. We have seen already, and most people will be aware of what shale gas did and, and in how short a period of time it became prevalent in the US, it will turn the US into a gas exporter, uh, hitherto one of the biggest importers. And what we have seen over the last few years is the emergence of shale oil. We have already in last year's energy outlook, we were the first, I think, made the forecast that North America is likely to become energy independent by 2030. We stand by that forecast from today's perspective, and if anything, that process will go faster and smoother than we thought last year. And that will be largely the result of an increase uh, in, in also tight oil. What we have in, in, uh, as a finding of this outlook on the high level is that production increases will more or less remain concentrated in North America, even though the resource base is global. And that is one important uh, finding here. Why is it concentrated in North America? As I said, not because the resources are concentrated there, but because the above ground conditions in North America are right to develop new technologies and to produce these resources. In particular, it is competition. It is a place which has free entry. Everybody can go and invest there. Everybody does. And that breeds that competition, which in turn breeds those technologies which gave us shale gas and which now give us tight oil. There's a range of implications, big and small, and uh, one of them is that the current configuration of global oil markets may come under pressure because all of this growth, which I just described, will take place outside the OPEC countries. That means it's not subject to any kind of production quotas, and that in turn will mean that uh, we think OPEC will have to cut production. On a bigger scale, of course, what this changes is uh, the whole debate on uh, the geopolitics of energy, on energy security. If North America becomes energy independent, uh, then by the same token, other countries, uh, Europe as a unit and also China and India, become more energy dependent. It will have consequences also on the global economy. Half of the trade deficit of the U.S. today is from energy. And to the extent that the U.S. also becomes almost self-sufficient in energy, that part of the U.S. deficit would shrink and it would rise in other countries who become more import dependent from energy. It then has consequences also for carbon emissions. Two years ago we have pointed out that the world is unlikely to reach this target given to us by scientists who say that by, we should limit carbon emissions to a certain level. But there is also some positive developments. What we are seeing in the forecasting period, or say between 2010 and 2030, is that carbon emissions in the US are actually likely to fall. They're also likely to fall in Europe, where they have already fallen between 1990 and 2010. And they will continue to rise in the non-OECD countries, including China, but they will decelerate there.
We see very rapid renewable growth, somewhere between 7 and 8 percent, the fastest growing fuel by far. But of course, this is still contingent and dependent on government support, because renewables are costly and they are not yet competitive with fossil energies. Renewables as a subsidized sector are not exposed to the same forces of competition. Yet, the entire hope everybody has for renewables rests on them becoming more efficient in order to become cost competitive with fossil fuels. So the question is, can renewables do that? And uh, I think it's probably possible. But right now we still have to say that uh, when you look at the big picture for fossil fuels, contrary to what many people think, the question is not when will we run out, the question is what happens next.